you know, say FTX that collected billions and billions of dollars, but never bought the Bitcoin actually. So, so um, why is this a problem? If FTX stole billions of dollars in a BlockFi and Voyager and Three Arrows and and Celsius and and uh, Terra Luna, if all of those ecosystems basically collected people's money and then lost all the money, then people that legitimately wanted to own Bitcoin had their money stolen from them. Michael Saylor, the MicroStrategy Executive Chairman and Major Bull, shared his perspective on the fall of the FTX empire in a recent interview. Bankman Fried's company was responsible for issuing a token called FTT, which offered various benefits to users of his exchange. Once a top 25 cryptocurrency, the asset collapsed by over 90% in value during a run on FTX last month, after which its bankruptcy quickly followed. According to Saylor, Bankman Fried's use of FTT and other tokens as collateral for taking out loans was particularly diabolical, given their relative illiquidity. However, traditional banks such as Goldman Sachs would refuse to lend money on such risky collateral. As such, Bankman Fried turned to himself using Alameda to borrow FTX users' funds on the FTT collateral. Then, Alameda used those funds to prop up the price of FTT, allowing the company to borrow even more funds and slide money into Sam Bankman-Fried's holding company, Paperbird. Saylor said that for years there has been a low-grade boiling guerrilla war between the Bitcoin community and the larger crypto community over industry practices that he repeatedly called shitcoinery. In Saylor's perspective, FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried was the poster child, of the latter. There is something ethically broken about being able to issue your own unregistered security. Sam and most of the people in the crypto world were always guilty of the sin of shitcoinery, he said. Saylor attributes such behavior to his perceptions of the crypto community's inherent problems, greed, arrogance, and foolishness. Saylor said that the diabolical twist in the FTX story was that SBF generated billions of dollars out of tokens he printed out of thin air, as well as issuing himself billions in loans from customer funds. While many have debunked the story of SBF and his mismanagement of funds, the community on Reddit applauded Saylor for his clear explanation of the situation and his straightforward comparison with Bitcoin. This was not Saylor's first comment surrounding the FTX scandal. In the early days of the unraveling, he was one of the first, along with Binance CEO Changpeng Zhao, to urge the community to practice self-custody. He also talked about crypto regulation and how hard it would be to put a regulation on digital assets as NoNo even had a simple explanation about what digital assets are about. We will now get into the video to hear what Michael has to say about the FTX collapse and its effect on his beloved Bitcoin. Ensure to like the video, subscribe, and drop your comments below. We know they gave them billions and billions of dollars of credit, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe up to $10 billion of credit. Well, how much did you get as a bona fide the, MicroStrategy CEO when you were in the market trying to raise cash, right? That, that, that there's the direct comparison that we can use. Yeah. If, if I were to go to a bank and say, I have some locked MicroStrategy stock, will you loan me money against it? They would say, no, zero. If I, if I went to them, zero, right? Uh, the the answer, by the way, to the question is a disinterested CEO of a crypto bank that was um, honest and competent would have lent Alameda somewhere between zero dollars and ten million dollars. Right. Like like the number is not one order of magnitude less. It's not even two orders of magnitude less. Right. It's somewhere in the range of three orders of magnitude less. If you were honest and competent you would basically say, well, what is 5% of the honest trading liquidity in the token? If the thing trades 100 million a day, but 80 million is washed trading, there's 20 million a day. Well, how much of that is trading on another exchange, not your own? Oh, 3 million a day. Okay, so $3 million of this stuff trades on, on another exchange. Is that, can I trust that one? No, they're not, none of them are regulated. Okay, how much trades you know on any regulated exchange? Well, of course, none of it, right? But but let's say I threw out the issue of a regulated, transparent exchange. I just said, well, how much trades on how much trades on an exchange other than one you own? Ten million. Okay, I'll give you ten percent of that. I'll give you one million dollars of collateral value. Okay, how much could you borrow against a million in collateral? Well, the max is fifty percent loan to value, five zero. So. I will give you a $500,000 loan against $8 billion of FTT token. 
that's the right answer if you're honest and competent. So obviously that didn't happen. The reason it didn't happen is because you had you had uh, three related parties all terminating with one boss, and the one boss was not honest, not competent, and and uh, not disinterested. Right? Mm -hmm. A biased, dishonest, incompetent person. Okay, what could go wrong? Well, when you when you have uh, three related parties and and a biased, incompetent dishonest person the what can go wrong is the entire thing gets burned to zero and is that likely yes highly likely it's it's not even just what could go wrong it's highly likely that's the reason there's a stigma attached to related party transactions you would never want the ceo of a bank to be issuing loans to a private company that they owned right i mean like if if it turned out that the CEO of JP Morgan was issuing billion dollar loans to you know to Jamie Diamond, you know, real estate development company <laughs> jointly owned with him and his wife, right? People would just lose it. Yep. Right? For obvious reasons. So what I can't figure out this part of the story is the SEC they knew like that there, there, there's documented meetings between Sam and uh, and I believe Gensler himself, if not some of his team. What were they sitting on? I can't figure that out for the life. First of, me. of all, I have I haven't no one has credibly documented that there were meetings. We know that there was a calendar entry where someone that worked for Gensler might have had a meeting, but we don't okay. know anymore. So we're waiting for verification on that. Okay. I've, I, I think I've I've read that there were many, many more meetings with the CFTC than the right. FCC and many, many more with politicians. But mm -hmm. we don't know the content of any of those meetings. No one has made that public. But what is your question? Where were the regulators? It seems to me as though you said it before that there was were they sitting on their hands did they know is there more to this the regulators story seem it seems like they just don't really want to they they don't feel that they have the authority to regulate offshore entities right i mean that's been the right. big blind spot because and, he had it all registered in the bahamas right i mean ftx was was in the bahamas and so I, I, there's this um there's this uh, vacuum of power, right? A grace, what, what a blind spot where the U.S. regulators don't feel like they have authority to regulate offshore entities. And the action they've taken has been via, via in civil enforcement actions, which are very slow and very expensive, like take years and years and years. And so they have basically, they have pursued a, you know, a number of entities via civil enforcement slowly. But they haven't really, uh, uh, they haven't laid out any global framework for digital assets, and they haven't pursued offshore entities. They haven't even really pursued onshore entities that aggressively. So there's been a lack of, you know, a lack of effective enforcement. I think you could say, and a question about who should take leadership of it. But you know, Congress has been mired. They haven't passed a law. They couldn't pass a stablecoin law. They haven't passed. It. While SBF maintains that he had little knowledge of what happened internally at Alameda Research, it is widely suspected that the trading desk was closely involved in the events leading up to both companies' bankruptcies. Court filings revealed last month that Alameda was secretly exempted from FTX's auto liquidation mechanism, a privilege Saylor referred to as God Mode. He generated $10 billion in an unregistered security and then just borrowed $10 billion secretly from his depositors, explains Saylor. Gambled it, traded it, spent it, lost it. Saylor added that VCs investing in FTX had effectively supported an offshore unregulated casino and hadn't done due diligence. Kevin O'Leary, a paid spokesperson and early investor in FTX, admitted that he and other investors had over-relied on each other's due diligence processes. Sam Bankman-Fried was regarded as an industry savior mere months ago as his company stepped in to provide emergency liquidity for multiple failing firms including BlockFi and Voyager. At the time, SBF framed his rescue action as an altruistic attempt to protect the industry rather than to make a profit. However, Saylor alleges that Bankman Freed only intended to protect those companies to prevent them from calling for their money back from Alameda. Ultimately, Saylor believes FTX's extremely low trading fees were a ploy to lure traders into putting assets on the platform, which SBF could then freely trade with. 
The FTX disaster is still being talked about even after weeks of its occurrence because of the extent of damage it has done to investors and the crypto industry as a whole. We are committed to bringing you these news stories as they happen. Please ensure to like the videos, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Thanks for watching.